Hi everyone. So, when I got to the end of the lecture today, I realized that I'd run out of time. I'm not sure if Andrew also ran out of time in the B stream, but I'm guessing that he did, because my slides were a little bit long, and there was a lot of detail, right? We're talking about variables, we're talking about if statements, we're talking about relational operators for questions and if statements. It was just, just a bit dense, right? So we didn't quite get to the end of the code demonstration I wanted to do, but I still consider that quite important. So I thought I would record this video now where I'm going to go through that uh, program that I was putting together for a sort of a Dungeons and Dragons kind of situation where you have to roll dice and you have to see whether they meet a number or not. And it was going to tie together a lot of the things that we were working on. So a lot of things about input and output, so being able to print things to the screen, being able to read things from the screen, uh, well not from the screen, from the user typing stuff into the terminal. Uh, and on top of that, um, making decisions based on um, based on numbers meeting thresholds or not, that kind of thing. So what we're going to do, um, let me just, where was I, switch back to the lecture slides and talk about this and then start writing some code. I'll probably go from the code where I was up to, but um, I'll explain it as I go. So we're playing a game of catacombs and large reptiles, <laughs> and what we're going to do with this is roll two dice and those two dice, we're going to see the results of each of those dice, add them together, check them against to a total that we're going to keep as one of the constants of our program, just to show you how to use constants as well. And then we're going to report back to the user whether the dice was equal, higher, or lower than the secret number. So as we were talking about today, we're talking about a lot of different things that we can use. So let's look about what our, look at what our program needs to be able to make this work. Uh, I realized that on my video recording here, my face is in the way of some of the text there on the slides. I don't think we've lost that much of it though, so hopefully it'll be okay. Uh, most of this is going to be code anyway, so I'm going to go across the code in a second. So, what does that program need? Sending information to the user, receiving information from the user. We talked about printf and scanf today, so we're going we're gonna to put those into practice. We're going to use them a little bit, see how they go. We need a way to compare numbers. Uh, comparing numbers is going to happen in, in, in a question and an if statement, so in that expression that the if statement tests to decide whether or not it runs. Uh, so we're going to use some relational operators there. Um, so there's if and the if and else. I'm pointing at the screen, which is like next to my camera. That's not helping you at all. I wonder if I can line up. Yeah, I, those stuff. Okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop pointing. But you know. Okay, so we are going to be. Uh, testing against a secret number. The secret number is a is a number that we're going to store. We're going to store several numbers actually, because we're going to store the numbers for each of the dice and another one for the total. So we're going to see some variables and a constant, I think. Um, we're going to use if and else statements to look at deciding which bit of code we're going to run. So this hopefully is just going to tie together everything that we've talked about today uh, about different kind of programming constructs and how we can get our first sort of basic program running. First thing we're going to do is comments. We always really want to describe our program. There's two different ways of doing comments. There's with the opening and closing of the comments, and there's also just at the start of each line. So if I go across to the code that I was writing, a bit of Linux here. So I'm here in my home directory. You can tell because it's my name there. Yours will be your ZID. Um, what have I got in here? I'm going to go to the comp1511 directory here, and we were lecture 2, I tab completed that, make it a little easier for myself, um, check out what I've got in here, I've got a dicechecker.c, so, tab complete that, oh wait, I have something called dice in there, so it won't, di it won't tab complete beyond that, but dicechecker.c, oh, I don't know why I did cd there, I'm going to edit that. Dicechecker.c. The AND allows my terminal to keep running while my gedit window is running. Okay, so here's my gedit window. I'm just going to move it so that it's not behind my little picture of my own face there. Okay. So in my lecture I've gotten up to a certain point. I'm not sure where ever I got up to in Andrew's lecture, but I'm just going to explain the code that I've got here. Here's the comments, and so coming from the slides, that's where I was going to be with the comments. I was going to talk about um, what this program did. This comment's pretty quick here. I would probably usually want to write more than this, so let's just add a little bit more here. Oops. Page 
page down by accident. Um, okay, program that takes two dice rolls, um, adds them together and tests the total against a secret target number. It will then tell the user whether they have met the target or not. Okay, a little bit more information than I had originally there, which just gives you the ability to look at this and say, okay, this is exactly what this thing does. And so when I look down here into the code, I can see what's happening. All right, let's have a look at our code. Include standard input output dot h. I, I sometimes I, I say the long form of things because it's just like I'm trying to explain what standard IO means. This is the thing that once we do this, we can use stuff like printf and scanf. So we're just keeping that line in there. We're going to explain in more detail what hash include does later on. Hash define secret number seven. So this is three separate words here. Hash define tells my um, tells the compiler actually to grab this thing secret number and make it seven so we've got this that's going to allow us to anytime we use the words secret number I mean it's all kind of one word because there's an underscore here but like in English it's two words but in code it's just one block of letters anytime we use secret number it's going to use the number seven wherever we have secret number uh, the nice thing about this, actually, about this constant, is if I was to change the target number for something, all I'd need to do is change this number here, and then secret numbers all the way through my code in different places. Well, maybe. Depends on how this ends up. Okay, so I've got my die 1 and my die 2. Uh, I set them, uh, we, were we were discussing this in the lecture, the, the different things we could do to set this. If we don't set this to any values, then it is an undefined value, uh, which means that... Uh, we're going to have a problem with it if we try to do any calculations with it and we haven't set it to anything. Another way we could do it for sort of safety sake here is I've set it to minus one so that if it turns out to be minus one, then we know that something else here that we've done hasn't worked or it's been unsuccessful or, or who knows. Um, but you don't necessarily have to set this to anything if you're sure that this next section is going to succeed. So this next section is us talking to our user and getting information from our user. So the first thing is asking the user to type in the value of the first die, and that's a printf. So printf says, I'm going to display something to the terminal. So when this runs, this gets displayed to the terminal. Scanf says, I'm going to wait for the user to type something in. And when they type something in, if it matches this format, we will write it into this variable. And it's this variable is sitting somewhere in memory. You know, I was talking about in memory, there's like chunks of memory, is like 32 bits of memory, that kind of thing. This and tells scanf, this little and symbol here tells scanf where in memory this particular variable is so they know where to write the information. Um, we do that twice each one for the different variables. And so that way we end up with two variables, uh, both having input from the user and both ending up with the value that the user tells us. So if you're in my lecture, we actually went through this and did some testing. We will, I'll just do it again here in a second because I've got most of this happening. The next thing we we're going to do is we we're gonna calculate the total. And just to make sure we know what we're doing, we're going to report what that total is. And so if we're going to report what that total is, we're going to get some decent information about what's going on in our program so we know whether it's working or not. You won't always need to know whether it's working or not. Sometimes you don't need this little output. You only need to know whether the role was successful or not. But in terms of just getting you used to doing things, I thought it would be nice to have this. So first thing we do calculate the total. We're going to calculate the total by grabbing ourselves another integer variable called total. And this integer variable doesn't have a value to begin with, but we're going to give it a value as we create it. So we declare it. Declaring is saying, I want an integer. This is its name. My computer is then going to reserve 32 bits of memory for me somewhere. And then I'm going to say, let's initialize this immediately upon its creation. So initializing this now 
means I'm going to take the values that are currently stored in the variables die1 and die2 and do some basic maths, add the two together, and the total of this is going to be what's put into total. And we'll see this in practice because this is going to output this, so we can see this happening. Um, in fact, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to comment out this section of code and we'll run the previous section of code. So remember, this is an interesting thing about comments, right? When I said we put comments in for the user to see things, the computer will ignore the comments, which means it's nearly like me saying if I comment out this code, my compiler is going to ignore that bit of code and not run it. So we can just run this bit of code here and see how it goes. So oh, I'm just going to clear my screen here. You can do that if you want to see so this command clear is just going to get rid of everything that's on the screen before. I'm just doing it now so it's a little bit needy. You can see what's happening. Okay, so I'm going to compile what I have. So DCC the dice checker.c file. This file needs to then be read and then create a program. So the output of this, the program, I think I called it dice. I was just being, just letting you know that the output program name doesn't always have to be the same as the C file's name, but often we do. So I could actually call this dice checker if I want to. But since I've got, I've already started and I call it dice, I'm just going to leave it called dice. All right, compilation worked. As I said before, compilation doesn't always work. We'll show you some examples of not working. I mean, you're going to you're, you're gonna get to this. You're going to get to this in labs and stuff, right? You're going to be like, ooh, DCC has a lot more to say sometimes when I haven't typed things in right. Um, and we'll get into that later. For now, I'm going to show you code that's sort of mostly working, but we'll, we'll have a look. All right, so if I've created this program dice, I'll just do an ls so you can see. So there's my dicechecker.c. There's also this dicechecker.c with a tilde on the end of it. That's gedit just being nice to you. So when you save it, or sometimes even, I think even when you don't save it, um, uh, gedit is like keeping this file up to date. So if I was to, you know, the dreaded rm command that can remove files, if I was to accidentally remove this file, there's a backup here. It might not be exactly the same file, might be a little bit older, but at least you're not going to lose everything immediately on deleting this file. Okay, what I've created is my program called dice. I have run the um, 1511 colors command. I'll just run it again so you can see. I'm not sure exactly if this is going to be okay. You know, it's fine. So it's, it's happy to do it even after I've already run it previously. Um, this gives me terminal colors. Oops, <laughs> I was pressing the up arrow. I was looking for my ls. There we go. This means it'll show me different colors for different types of files that are currently in my directory. So the green one says, I'm a file that can run. I'm a program that's been translated into, um, oh sorry, I'm the code after it's been translated into a program that you can run. And here's the code that hasn't been translated yet. And so this is in this sort of intermediary language that us and the computer can understand. This is after the computer's had a good look at our code and said, okay, this is exactly what I'm gonna do with it. So if I am to run that now, dot slash dice, I can type in the value of one die, uh, I'm just going to do five, value of another die, I'm going to do two, seven in total. So we have a reasonable idea that what we're doing is working. I am not going into detail on um, not putting the right values in and stuff. That is an experiment that I, I encourage you to try because it does weird things, but we're not going to worry too much about that right now because I'm trying to get you into like just the code structures, not the details of how ScanF works. Yeah, so I know that this is most likely working because I'm putting in a 5 and a 2 and I'm getting a 7 out of it, so I think my addition is working reasonably well. Okay, back to my code over here. We also had to test against the secret number to see whether we were successful or not. So I'll uncomment this code, and uncommenting it is going to bring it back into the view of the compiler. So the compiler is going to say, oh, I am no longer, um, I'm no longer ignoring um, this code written here because it's not a comment, it's code, so I'm going to look at it and I'm going to try to make sure it runs. So testing it against the secret number. This ties in some of the later stuff that we did in the lecture where we have an if statement. So remember the if statement has the keyword if, then it has a question here in the brackets 
and you could call it an answer here in the curly brackets. So what we're going to get with this kind of setup is the question is going to ask is there a condition that holds or not? Is there a condition that is currently happening? And the question we're asking here is given that we've taken some numbers in and added them together we don't really know what total is because every time you run the program it could be different because this is just input from the user. So we don't know for sure whether this is more or less than secret number so we have to ask. So I'm asking is total greater than or equal to secret number? If the total is greater than or equal to secret number I put a comment here that's just sort of inside the curly brackets that says if we are inside the curly brackets the target was met. So that means that the number was greater than or equal to the secret number. And so some of these comments in here will allow us to remember what the answer to our question was. If the target was met, we're going to print f roll was successful. Uh, so what we're going to get then is anything that's 7 or higher, we should see this message. Anything that's not 7 or higher, we shouldn't see that message. So I'm going to save this, compile it again, so compile it with all this code in it, run it again, and then we'll just have a little test and see what it looks like. I'm using my up arrow to find my old uh, commands and I see my, I've got a DCC command here that's going to recompile it. Okay, that compiles. I'm going to run it again and let's test to make sure that the success roll is actually happening. Um, so I will do a 3 and a 4 which is going to be a 7 you rolled seven total, roll was successful. Okay, good start. Uh, let's make sure that if we're not successful, we're not printing that out by accident, so I'm just gonna do a one and a one. I rolled two in total. So there's me, sorry, my chair just broke. <laughs> um, there's me seeing that the if statement is triggering on a seven or more, and it's not triggering on a value that's less than that. Uh, I would need to do some more comprehensive testing to be really sure of this, but you know, I'm sort of okay for now that this is probably working. Okay. So this is where we got up to in the lectures, um, but I just wanted to go back over it just in case. So this is mostly actually what we needed, but I wanted to show something else as well, which was what happens if in this case, we're lower than the um, than the target number that we're looking for. We do want to be able to report that that happened. So a few different ways we could do this. We could actually just go if total is less than secret number. I'm going to tab complete that makes it easier. Then I could do something, but I don't find that quite as neat as as another way of doing this which is to use one of the other constructs that we looked at today, which is the else statement. So you can see me using these curly brackets here. The curly brackets allow us to contain our code in specific sections. So the if statement says, the first thing that happens after the if statement is the thing that runs if the if statement is true. Me putting these curly brackets around it here makes it really, really explicit. It makes it like this is definitely what is happening. So the only thing that's happening is, if this if statement is true, exactly what's inside these curly brackets is going to run. Nothing more than the curly brackets, but nothing less. It'll be the entirety of what's inside the curly brackets. This makes it easier for us to see as well. You can note that I have also indented what's inside the curly brackets, so it's easy for me to read. I can say that if statement, the only code that's going to run inside that if statement is going to be the stuff that I put indented and in inside the curly brackets. We're going to go over more of this stuff in detail, more of the stuff about how we're actually going to structure our programs, but this is a good starting point. It's good for us to think about it now. So the else statement says, and I rem you remember this from the lectures, if we're total higher than the secret number, higher than or equal to the secret number, we're going to run the first bit of code which is this first bit of curly brackets. The else statement says only if this thing failed. So if this thing gave us a false, which is a zero, uh, which is total was not greater than or equal to the secret number, then this, what's inside these curly brackets definitely runs. What's inside this curly brackets definitely doesn't run. So the if else says only one of these two things can run and we will decide based on that time we checked the question. We checked the question at the beginning of this and then we decide between each of these two 
forks of options that we're going to take. Okay, so the else would be the opposite of the role was successful. We can print f role was a failure. You have failed in the dungeon and the dragon is eating you now. Um, I'm sure the game is more, much more complex than that, but you know. Okay, so this means that now, no matter what role people give us, we will give them back some feedback. We will say it was either a success or a failure. So let's compile this and run it again. Saving that. I was just pressing Control S there and saving. I, I realize a lot of the time that if I use any keyboard shortcuts that you won't see what I'm doing. So I try to say Control S every time I'm doing a Control S. Um, if you want to, I think this icon saves the file, or you can go to File here and go Save, but that one also kind of tells you, it's like, okay, you could have pressed Control S. So sometimes I'll do fast things like that. Okay, this file is saved, ready for compilation. I'm going to use my up arrow key to go back through my previous commands until I find my compilation command. Sometimes it's easier, right? It's not going to be as many up arrow presses as it is me trying to type things in correctly. So that compilation command happens and I run this again and I can test some things. I might just test um, some other values. So there's a two and a six. Also, I'm just sort of arbitrarily limiting, limiting this to values of 1 to 6. You don't necessarily have to do that, right? Because this is an integer. As I said, integers are from negative uh, 2 bajillion <laughs> to positive 2 bajillion. Really, really large values. They're not just between 1 and 6. But we just happen to be looking at dice now, so I'm just sort of doing that. I mean, there's plenty of dice that are not 1s to 6s. There's lots of other kinds of dice as well. But for the moment, keeping this example reasonably simple. So. The 2 and the 6 add up to 8, says the roll was successful, there. You may just notice that like even though I added in the failure, I still checked the success thing. There's this thing that we kind of do is like every time we test things, we tend to test everything just in case something we've done has broken a previous part of our code. Okay, try this again and let's see if our failure case is going to work or not. So I'm going to put in a 3 and a 2. You rolled five total, roll was a failure. Okay, so now we're reporting back all the information we need to. We're saying um, the success information and the failure information. I'm gonna hop back to my slides and I'm gonna skip through because I've gone through a lot of stuff that's in the slides here. Slides are always back there for your reference as well if you want. Uh, I also actually, I think in the program in the slides I may have checked for a tie as well, I'm not sure. So we've got the secret number, We've got the main function, we're storing some numbers, we're scanning input, we're totaling it. So I've talked through all of this already, so I'm just going to skip through the slides pretty quickly. Uh, you can always go back through these if you need to um, look at more detail and see what I've, I've been speaking about there. So we're testing the total against the target, and we have the success here. So it's a similar kind of comments that I had. I think I put the comment up here instead. Um, and the failure... Um, we don't necessarily have to test for the failure, so we have this else. And I have some more detail here that you can read in the slides. It's like, okay, we didn't actually have to test this because it was the only other possibility. So now we have the dice check program. Uh, we have a program that you can put any two numbers in and will check against the secret number. We could have changed the secret number to other things. We can accept different numbers from our dice rolls. We can roll 20-sided dice. We can roll 12-sided dice. All kinds of things if we want to. But I also want to leave you with a, a bit of a challenge here, if you want to. There will be ways to modify the code that we have. Let me just go back to the code while I'm talking about this. This program here, which I'll make available, I'll put it up on the lecture slides section. We could modify this code so that we were not just testing for success and failure. We could test for success, exact ties, and failure. And there'll be another way to set up this kind of number checking part of our code to test for those different things. Um, there's another thing that we could do, and this is more advanced and it could be really interesting if you want to do this, is we could test for the idea of a double. So maybe the game that I'm in says if you roll two of the same number, then your success or failure is a critical success or failure, which means that, I don't know, like it has more effect or something like that. So you roll like a double three 
and that turns into a critical failure, or you roll a double four and that turns into a critical success, or like a double six. I mean, that's like a huge critical success, you know. Depends on how the game's going to run. Uh, not up to us, we're just making a program that just sort of plays around with these things. So it'd be interesting if you want to look into it, uh, see if you can add stuff to this code that I've written here that finds an exact tie, um, so that's a different possible outcome for the total, or can detect doubles where the first and second die are the same value and then they're critical and you can still report whether it's a success or fa failure and whether it's a critical or not. Um, see what you do when you're playing around with it. Okay, um, this is sort of the wrap-up from the lecture today so I probably don't need to go through this so much but what we have done in this program is we've been able to use variables. We haven't used our doubles yet, we've just used integers, but that's okay, because they act uh, reasonably similarly. There's, there's differences, but we'll go into that. We're able to print stuff to the screen using printf, and we're also able to print out variables using printf. So in the code here, we've got the ability to print out uh, here. We're showing our format of how to use this pattern here to say there's going to be a number coming and this is the variable that that number comes from. We've also used the scanf and the pattern in there as well. Um, we've used our maths, we've done some simple maths to add two variables together and then adding two variables together we've saved the value in another variable, we can do that, and we can save in, in any kind of variable there if we want to, well not any kind, but we could even have put this value into one of these if we want to. It sort of didn't make sense though, it made more sense to make a new one called total. We've looked at if and else statements as well, so we've looked at the ability to ask questions about our code and decide how our code's going to run based on the answers to these questions. So the question in this case is, was our total greater than or equal to the secret number? If it's greater than the secret number, this bit of code runs. If it's less than the secret, sorry, it's greater than or equal, this bit of code runs. Otherwise, this bit of code runs. I might actually just leave a comment in here to remind myself. Uh, total less than secret number. It just gives me a little bit of information about what happened in this if and else here. All right, so then we have the ability to run this code. So we're only going to print out either one of these two, um, the success if we're greater than or equal to the, the target number, the failure part if we were less than the target number. And we've got some information in here that shows that. Okay, I'm gonna control S on that. I'm gonna leave you there with the code and the choice if you want to, to try playing around with these challenges if you like. Okay. Uh, I hope that gives everyone enough information to get going on things and in your tutorials and labs in week two we're going to go further on these ideas. We're going to be using if statements, we're going to be using a bit of maths and stuff like that. So uh, hopefully you will get plenty more practice on this and, and this will become second nature to everyone. Alright, see you soon!